Zheng Guo. After hearing the testimony, the Chinese judge had come to his decision. Takamatsu Sensei was given the death penalty. In films, the sad results of unfortunate incidents such as these are glamorized and sometimes even made to be seen as comical. But this was real. Someone had died and it was certainly nothing to laugh about. For Takamasu Sensei, the gravity of this situation had become crystal clear even before the judge had sentenced the young master to die. In the early 1900s in China, this type of verdict usually led to execution by decapitation. Now, I guess that you already know that Takamatsu Sensei was eventually exonerated and cleared of any wrongdoing in this case. What's more is that Takamatsu went on to live a long and fulfilling life after this incident. Still, what you might not have considered before today is, why? Why did Takamatsu Hisasugu deserve to live? What positive things did the master do in China that demonstrated his character and worth as a person. Finally, what can we all learn from Takamatsu Sensei's incredible life experiences and how exactly can his deep insights help us personally to find happiness even in the most troubling times? Hello and welcome. These are dedicated to shining a new light on the life of Takamatsu Tochitsuko Sensei and sharing exciting details from Grandmaster Shoto Tanamura's new book series called Takamatsu's True Martial Arts Legacy, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Grandmaster Shoto Tanemura. My name is Michael Coleman, and my title is Kiyoshi. I've been a student under Tanimura Soke since 1987. These videos will offer many of the exclusive insights I've learned from Soke. Plus, they'll highlight never-before-published facts and martial arts legacy passed down to us by Grandmaster Tochitsuko Takamatsu. Nihon. What needs to be known about one of Takamatsu Sensei's most important teachers? In 1906, Meiji 39, at the age of 17, Takamatsu Sensei met Ishitani Matsutaro Takakage in Kobe, Japan. The Takamatsu family owned an important match factory in the Hirodome district of the city. Ishitani had already reached 61 years old and the master was looking for work as a security guard. Takamatsu begged his father to hire Ishitani right away and also provide him with lodging at the factory boarding house. Hisasugu did this because he knew that Soke Ishitani was a great master of Budo. Takamatsu Sensei desperately wanted to learn from him. With that part finished, they quickly constructed a small dojo in an extra space in the factory. This was where Ishitani instructed Takamatsu Sensei 
and a small group of others. In only a few years of very intense training, Takamatsu Sensei learned an impressive number of martial arts skills from a long list of secret traditions. Very sadly, Ishitani Matsutaro Sensei passed away in Meiji year 42 on November 29th, 1909. But fortunately, Takamatsu Sensei had the once in a lifetime opportunity to absorb the highest teachings during the last three years of Ishitani Sensei's life. Following is an incomplete list of some of the main arts taught to Takamatsu Sensei by this great Igaru ninja master. Ikanu Koppo Jitsu, Hontai Takagi Yoshinru Ju Jitsu, Hontai Takagi Yoshinru Bo Jitsu, Kukishin Den Hapobikin Jitsu, Kijin Josuru, Kukishin Den Tai Jitsu, Kukishinru Tai Jitsu, Hakunru Nimpo Ninjitsu. For the purpose of demonstration, let's focus mostly on the first three Ruha traditions on this list. Gikanru Bojutsu. The tenth generation grandmaster of Gikanru Kopojitsu, Uru Gikambo, the second. Was a loyal samurai who is at the forefront of the restoration of power to the Emperor of Japan. Late in the summer of 1863, the famous Tenchu Kumi uprising began during the Battle of Takatori Castle. Gikombo unfortunately suffered a gunshot wound as well as a number of cuts to his right arm. Eventually, the master was forced to stop fighting and collapsed near a hill. Luckily for all of us, fellow loyalist, Master Ishitani Matsutaro, <laughs> happened to notice Gikombo in that vulnerable condition and risked his own life to rescue him. Ishitani Matsutaro carried Gikombo to an old temple near the town of Gojo. There, Ishitani was able to revive Gikombo, and they escaped to Iga. After spending some time together, Ishitani Matsutaro inherited the martial art tradition of Gikan Kopojutsu. Now, Grandmaster Ishitani was already an accomplished master of several martial arts traditions. Tanemura Kotaro Hanji. Oh, 
holding Nenkyo Kaigen in the lineages of Takagi Yoshinru. Kukishinru and others. There are many special secret weapons included in these Ruha. Here is an example. <laughs> I picked this particular Buki weapon to demonstrate because I believe that its name is a metaphor for how many other weapons should be used. On the surface, Nio means to comply with, I means intention, Bo means staff, and Jutsu means art. But even within the first kanji character, there is much deeper meaning beyond this. On a spiritual level, Nio can refer to revealing the true nature of all things within your heart. Like the Japanese phrase, Keiichi no, it is inseparable, like the form and its shadow. A person's deeds mirror the good or evil in his heart. <laughs> But if not for Ishitani Sensei's selfless act of kindness, none of us would be able to enjoy the techniques and knowledge handed down from the amazing Gikanru tradition. When did Soke Shoto Tanimura become the 14th generation grandmaster of Gikanru Kopojitsu? In 1989, Tanimura Sensei received from Sato Kenbi Sensei all of the techniques and secret written records he then show of Gikanru Kopojitsu. Soke is the 14th Grandmaster of the school, and Sato Kimbi Sensei was the 13th. Takamatsu Tochitsugo Sensei was the 12th. Part 5 of 8 In the first year of the Taisho era, 1912, Takamatsu Hisasugu Sensei boarded a ship 
bound for the city of Tianjin in China. Across the sea, the Qing dynasty was ending. It's interesting to note that the first two kanji characters for the name of the city, Tianjin, can be read in Japanese as Amatsu, like the term Amatsu Tatara. The old name of China at that time was Zhenghua Mingguo, or Chu Ka Mingkuku in Japanese. The current name is Zhengguo, or Chu Goku, as these kanji are pronounced in Japan. It's important to mention here that in addition to his mother tongue, Takamatsu Sensei could also speak English, Chinese, and later even a little French. This impressive ability to comprehend and communicate assisted Takamatsu greatly, and his accomplishments enabled Hisasugu to more deeply learn from, as well as to teach, several sophisticated persons in China. Lian Qingming, or Ren Kei Mei in Japanese, was Takamatsu Sensei's highest level Chinese born student. This Mandarin master of Japanese martial arts eventually received a Minkyo Kaiden mastership from Soke Takamatsu. His name literally meant Lotus Enlightened Brightness. It was Lian Qingming that set up Takamatsu Sensei's next challenge fight in China. Takamatsu Sensei's Challenge Fight, number four. One of Takamatsu Sensei's important matches in China was against Zheng Zilong, Chou Shi Ru in Japanese. He was one of the last practitioners of true traditional Shaolin Kung Fu, and he was born in the Shandong province of China. Zheng Zilong weighed in at 138 kilograms, over 300 pounds, and stood taller than most in the Asian crowd at 188 centimeters over six feet tall. By contrast, Takamatsu Sensei was only 68 kilograms, about 150 pounds, and just 170 centimeters, five feet six inches in height. Even though Cho Shiru was more than double Takamatsu Sensei's weight, the Shaolin master could still leap over two meters effortlessly. He also had strengthened and trained his entire body to be used as a weapon for many years. So Zheng Zilong could break rocks with his bare hands. The evening before the fight, Takamatsu Sensei sat in serious meditation. It should be very clear by now that sometimes matches such as these ended in the death of one or both of the participants. In a vision, the master saw a gentle butterfly calmly flying to and fro, smoothly avoiding every violent attack aimed at crushing it. After that, Takamasu Sensei said to himself, I am the butterfly. This was an enlightened moment of Budo Satori. After hearing about this, Soke Shoto Tanemura learned and mastered the technique that Takamatsu Sensei uses during this challenge match. Tanemura Sensei has named the strategy Kocho no Mai, Dance of the Butterfly. Hence, of this strategic movement theory can be seen throughout the Gimbukan Nempo Buge curriculum.
The match with Zhang Xiuqo lasted about 30 minutes. The intensity was very high throughout because both fighters had the capability to kill within only seconds of touching one another. The two warriors fought on a raised platform in the traditional Chinese way. So Takamatsu Sensei had to judge his leaps and evasive techniques very carefully. One wrong step would mean instant disqualification and defeat at best, and at worst, a broken leg. A half an hour later, Takamatsu's successful dancing butterfly technique surprised and impressed his seasoned opponent. So much so, in fact, that after the match was over and judged a draw, the Shaolin master paid Takamatsu Sensei the highest compliment. From then on, Master Zhang always referred to Takamatsu Sensei as his Liao Zhong which means elder brother in Chinese. They truly became what is known in Japan as Sensei Kyodai, sworn brothers in English. Through this cooperative relationship, Takamatsu Sensei would come to understand many kuden about traditional Chinese martial arts. Without this connection, these important secrets would have been lost forever. Sadly, sometime later, Takamatsu Sensei's martial arts younger brother, Master Zhang Xilong, was tragically lost when a bomb exploded in China. Takamatsu Sensei as a human being. Though it's true that Takamatsu Sensei encountered and conquered many extraordinary life situations that most would have called impossible. Still, like each of us, Takamatsu Sensei was also a ningen, a human being. Takamatsu Sensei's Challenge Fight, number five. Surprisingly, this next fight could not have ended up more differently than the previous one. First of all, it took place in a modern boxing ring, not a traditional dueling platform. Also, as a sporting contest, the rules certainly did not allow real self-defense techniques. The much celebrated and much larger Western boxer on the other side of the ring went by the name John Wander. In one of the rounds of this exhibition match, Takamatsu Sensei took a strong punch to the body. It was a sharp uppercut to the midsection that forced Hisasugu to spit up a little blood. Takamatsu Sensei was undaunted and was fully ready to continue fighting. Still, the referee unilaterally decided to use his power to stop the fight with a TKO. Takamatsu was declared the loser that day, but redemption was coming very soon. And in hindsight, this outcome ended up leading to one of the best things that could have happened. Redemption in the Garden of the commissioner. The sun was shining and the scene in the private garden was much quieter than the one before. There were no loud crowds of people, no admission fees to be collected, no gambling bets to be made or professional referees to hire. This was simply a gathering of skillful martial artists at the request of an important government official. In addition to bringing his top Chinese students, Takamatsu Sensei was accompanied by one of his Japanese disciples too, Ohashi Masaki. Also in attendance, on the other side of the courtyard, stood the now familiar figure of John Wander, confidently warming up for another victory. This time, however, both the rules and the outcome would not go in the Western boxer's favor. In front of the commissioner and everyone else in attendance, the well-mannered Takamatsu Kisasugu Sensei showed his integrity and reserve. Instead of seeking personal revenge 
on Mr. Wonder, Takamatsu allowed his student, Ohashi Masaaki, to teach the sportsman a lesson he would never forget. With the freedom to use traditional techniques taught to him by Takamatsu Sensei, Ohashi quickly bested the boxer with an immobilization lock, Gyaku Waza. Here are a few Gyaku Waza examples. This match elegantly demonstrated how, outside of sporting events, size and strength are not the only factors that decide victory or defeat. The government commissioner was definitely impressed by the grace and dignity he observed that day. Earning this amount of respect became a critically important factor in deciding Takamatsu Sensei's future later. Death. We cannot escape death. So why fear something that is part of life? A true warrior understands this and does not fear the sword cut. Soke Shoto Tanemura. The beginning of this video started with Takamatsu Sensei in jail, awaiting execution. At this point, I'm prepared to reveal some of the main reasons why I believe that Takamatsu Sensei deserved to be acquitted and set free. 1. The accidental death was not intentional and the actions Takamatsu Sensei performed at the time were done in self-defense. 2. Even though the judge had already made his decision, Takamatsu had positively impressed more than one Chinese government official, including the commissioner who had invited Hisasugu to his garden that day. These important people had the power to save Takamasu Sensei's life. 3. As a foreigner living in China for a relatively short period of time, apart from his skill as a martial artist, the only way that Takamatsu Sensei could have made such a deep and enduring effect on the hearts of these people was his Gyogi Saho. Gyogi means good manners, including polite language. It refers to the general manner in which you conduct yourself on a daily basis. Saho means the correct method of doing or making something. It's more specific and refers to the exact process and approach you need to take in order to get it done properly. Part 6 of 8 In 1916, after briefly going back to Japan, Takamatsu Sensei returned to the Tianjin area of China. After a match with a high-ranking Kodokan Judoka, Kisasugu Takamatsu earned his place as the head of a martial arts federation in China. It had over 3,000 student members. Still, even with such a high post, Takamatsu Sensei took the position as an unpaid volunteer. Contrary to popular belief, the master made no money from these great efforts to promote and protect traditional martial arts. Instead, for a time in China, Takamatsu Sensei earned his living humbly as a bookshop owner. Also, in the nearby Shandong region, Takamatsu was also able to make a little profit by trading pieces of silver for much needed industrial copper. Virtually all of the roads at that time, especially the ones used for trading, were very perilous in one way or another. Those people with enough courage to brave them had to watch out regularly for both wild animals as well as large groups of mounted bandits called bazoku in Japanese or maaze in Chinese. At one point, Takamatsu Sensei faced and defeated a group of seasoned bazoku. 
At that time, the master had already become quite expert in Chinese broadsword. This was taught to him by his younger brother, Shaolin master, Zhang Long. On that day, Takamatsu was forced to stand up and protect his own life with his Chinese blade in the ultimate way. Soke Tanamura always recounts these stories with the respect and seriousness they deserve. This is because these episodes were actual events that happened to a real person, not a fairy tale. Life or death situations are never things to speak of lightly. One day, before setting out into yet another particularly dangerous area, Takamatsu Sensei was forced to wait well into the evening for his Chinese chaperone to arrive. Being in unfamiliar territory, and now that the sun had already disappeared beneath the horizon, it was even more important that Takamatsu Sensei follow close behind the local guide. Even in the daytime, this confusing terrain was difficult to navigate. It was very easy to get lost. Unfortunately, even under the cover of darkness, danger did find Takamatsu Sensei again. But this time, what attacked him was not human. Takamatsu felt the animal approaching from behind before seeing the beast. The master then stopped in his tracks and stood completely still, using nimble breath control. Suddenly, a wild hound sprang up from behind the pair and dug its paws heavily into the back of Takamatsu Sensei's shoulders. Up on its hind legs, this feral dog must have easily stood over 170 centimeters tall, like a great wolf. Takamatsu Sensei judged this even in low light because the master could feel the creature's hot breath panting on the back of his head. A single forceful bite could have torn a gaping wound in Hisasugu's neck. Takamatsu Sensei's next move was critical. Any mistaken timing would have led to his death. In that case, all of his life's training would have been lost. Takamatsu needed to utilize extraordinary patience, Fudoshin, in order to escape. Suddenly, the correct moment came. The master had sensed it. In a flash, Takamatsu Sensei spun around and hit the wild dog in a Kyusho vital point with a special Kupojutsu knuckle strike. Despite its size, the huge animal could only manage to yelp loudly and make a stunned and hasty retreat. That evening, both Takamatsu Sensei and the Chinese guide were saved. In the Niniku Seishin, it states, The Niniku Seishin, Takamatsu Sensei, and Soke Tanamura all ask us to have this. Kajoraku, a flower feeling with peaceful enjoyment. But what does that mean? Let's start with Hewo Tanashimu Muna de Aru. Harmonious and peaceful enjoyment is the thing. Hana no gotuki joe o motte. Have humane love like a flower. In some cases, the flowers they were referring to can be symbols of enlightened wisdom. The simple truth is that we cannot control the actions of other people, but each of us can do our best to control our own proper behavior. The answer is not outside of us, it's inside of us. In this way, consistently showing the good manners of Gyogi Saho is the proof 
that we also possess the qualities of compassion, courage, as well as wisdom. As martial artists, this sincere kindness is not naive or childish in any way. Demonstrating the correct etiquette and polite behavior is a sign of true strength and integrity. How we deal with people in situations that we dislike is a true test of our character. The best way to pass this test is remember to have Gyogi Saho throughout all of our lives. This is one way the Gimbukan martial artists strive to handle everything that comes to us with dignity. Order of the Sacred Treasure. The Order of the Sacred Treasure is a Japanese order established on the 4th of January, 1888 by Emperor Meiji, originally called the Order of Meiji. This rare honor is awarded to persons who have engaged for many years in distinguished public service and who have consistently demonstrated impeccable character. This is a photo of my sensei, Tanamura Soke, during his years serving the community as Lieutenant, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. After retiring from law enforcement, Soke Shoto Tanamura made efforts for more than 32 years as a volunteer and also served as the chief in his area. For his many decades of selfless service, Soke received the Imperial Order of the Sacred Treasure in November of 2017 in the 29th year of the Heisei era. That same month, Soke was formally invited to meet the Japanese Minister of Justice with his wife. After that, Tanamura Sensei visited the inner chambers of the Imperial Palace and had an audience with His Majesty the Emperor of Japan. the final video in this series, I will reveal even more unique stories about Takamatsu Sensei's incredible life. Also, I'll introduce Soke Tanamura's teaching about the three parts of Shin Shin Shingan. I'm very excited for you to see it. I'll see you in the next video.